topic for today's service is portrait of an overcomer. Portrait of an overcomer. The life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as popular as it is, as widely known as it is, is somehow, to some degree, mysteries. Is this really possible? even though we profess we are his followers. And so because we were still in the, in the land of whether or whether or not about that, we're wondering, we could not receive the fullness of the purpose of his coming for our lives. Many Christians know about the stories of his birth, of his ministries, of his ministry, all the miracles, all the signs and the wonders, all the things he said and the, the ones he did. We know the story surrounding his birth or surrounding his ministry, how he was arrested, how they persecuted him and convicted him and, and how he was hung on the cross and, and all of that up to the point of his resurrection. We know all the stories. Unfortunately for many people, that is where it ends, the stories the stories. You see, the ignorance of how the, of, of the benefits that are accrues to you and I, not because of the stories, but because of the reality of what the story is, because of the truth that is contained in what we have heard, because of the, the promises and the covenant that is being outplayed right in front of us through what we call stories. Because we are, we are ignorant of these benefits, it is no wonder that the church is, 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 is short changing itself. It's no wonder you and I are still wondering and asking and questioning and struggling. Because all we know, all that we have are the stories, not the knowledge not the understanding, and therefore we cannot apply the wisdom to get the result that we need. The birth of Jesus was foretold. Every detail concerning his birth was told over and over and over and over again throughout the ages before he was born. The, the details of his ministry was declared. Everybody heard about it. Everybody knew about it. If nothing else, you would have heard it from John the Baptist. And if anybody should know about what is to come in the life of Jesus Christ and his ministry, John should know because they are cousins. And even if you miss all of that, when he came to this earth, he went into the synagogue according to his custom, and he declared, this is why I am here. He released, as it were, the manifesto of his ministry was delivered to the world from that pulpit in the synagogue. According to the gospel of Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4 from verse 4 to, sorry, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to verse 20. Luke 4, 18 to 20 says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He gave the details of why he's here, of what his purpose was. As if that was not enough, he then went on to tell us, look guys, this is going to happen. At some point along this journey, some people are going to come. They're going to accuse me. I'm going to be arrested. They will take me before the judge and they will pronounce me guilty. He said, but don't worry. They can do all of that. But on the third day, I will rise again. 
He told us everything. He didn't hide anything from you and I. He laid everything bare for us to see. But for some strange reasons that I can't understand and I can't explain, many Christians are still asking God. They're still praying to God. They're still fasting to God to give them something that they already have in their hands. Could it be because you don't know, you don't understand the completed work of Jesus Christ? Am I saying don't pray? No, that's not what I'm saying. Am I saying don't ask God? I've never, I didn't say that. I pray and I ask God things. Am I saying don't fast? No, who am I to legislate, legislate that you should not fast? All I'm saying is, Understand that the, through, the, through the completed work of Jesus Christ, when he said on the cross, it is finished. That was what he meant. It is finished. Can I give you a news alert? Nobody hopes for something that they already have in their hands. You don't, you, you, you can't be sitting in front of a bowl of food, steaming hot, and then hoping that maybe this hunger will disappear at some point. No, it's already with you. The solution is in front of you. But you see, the challenge for most of us is to know and understand what has already been deposited into our bank account by Jesus Christ through his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, ascension to, to, to heaven. When we know and understand what that meant for you and I, all we'll have to do is to go to that machine and pop your card in and put your number and all of God's goodness and mercy, all of his provision will come out. Everything that you desire will run you over. Like the psalmist say, said, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Why? Because I know what he has done. I understand what has been deposited for me. And I am not ashamed to go to that machine and make a withdrawal of all that God has perfected concerning me and my household. The only thing, the only area where you and I, where people are suffering and are in pain and this thing, in discomfort, are the areas where they are still ignorant, where they are still in the dark, where they don't know, they don't have a clue, they have no knowledge or understanding of what has already been done, of their inheritance in him, of the complete work of God through his son on the cross. No wonder the book of Hosea chapter four verse six says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It says, because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. My people, the people of God, they are perishing. They are lacking. They are in pain and discomfort. They are living with sickness. They are accommodating wound and, and shame and guilt because they lack the knowledge and the understanding of what has already been done for them. Is that you this morning? Is that where you are? Is that your house address? Because ignorance, they say, is no bliss. It is what you don't know that has the potential to harm you, to kill you, to maim you, to deny you of the title deed of that which is already yours by right, by promise, and by covenant. You and I, 
you and I, we have already been declared as overcomers. <laughs> we are already as an established overcomers because Jesus Christ, he completed all that is required for you and I to be that when he hung on the cross, when he died and he bled and he was buried and he resurrected and now he's in heaven, seated at the right hand side of God, proclaiming that I know him, she is mine, I know her, he is mine, I know them, they bear my mark. So what are the portraits of somebody who has already been declared an overcomer? The, the first portrait is that they are lovers of God and followers of Jesus Christ. A life without Christ is a life in crisis. Any life, any person, it does not matter what your degree, what your title, where you live, how you sleep, what you eat, who hangs with you. It is immaterial. If there is no Jesus Christ as the centerpiece of your life, your life is in crisis. Your life is like a sheep without rudder. It has no meaning. It has no purpose. It has no direction. And it has no destination. You know, this world that we live in, it will offer you a lot of things. It will make promises of a lot of things. It will dangle a lot of carrot before you. But the reality is the world is incapable of delivering on any of its promises. Well, today I don't agree with you there. Maybe that's your opinion. But I can tell you the only one who makes promises and keeps them, who cannot fail, who cannot deny himself, who will not disappoint you, is Jesus Christ. Because the best that this world can give is an empty hope that has no element of faith, therefore has no potential, no, no, no chance of producing anything. But when you turn your life over to God and you accept his gift of righteousness through his son, Jesus Christ, all of your battles become his, all of your needs is, is, is his responsibilities. The need to keep you well and keep you alive and keep you going, it's, it becomes his responsibility. Oh, well, today I hear you, but what about my rent? What about my school fees? What about my hospital bed? What about my bill? What about, the... maybe you didn't hear what I said. Everything that makes for your highest good, everything concerning your well-being is his responsibility. And that is why he tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, like, my God, the God that we know, the God that we serve, the living God himself, will supply, shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus Christ, not according to the Federal Reserve, by the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, not according to the interest rate of Bank of England, by the, the governor of the Bank of England. It has nothing to do with who is the president of your country and who is the chairman of your, of, of your company. It has nothing to do with that. He is the determinant and the last time I checked, he wasn't, he, he wasn't planning of declaring bankruptcy because he is, he is Jehovah too much. He's Jehovah plentiful. He's Jehovah overflowing. No wonder he said, whatever you need, I am. Jehovah El Shaddai. Whatever you need, I am that for you. Overcomers. 
are Christ followers. Because they know once Jesus, when Jesus makes you a promise, you can go to sleep. He's a promise keeper. And he's already said, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will not even leave you without a witness. When you have Jesus Christ in your life, even when you are physically separated from people, the, the, the sense of loneliness is never there because there's an understanding. There's a deep-rooted knowledge of the, of the truth that you are not on your own. Because wherever he is, he is there with you. Just allow him. Let him be the driver of this vehicle. Let him be the pilot of this aircraft. Let him be the one who is directing you and leading you. And for as long as you keep following him, you will never know lack. You will never know sickness. Shortage will not be your portion. Fear and trembling will disappear from your life and many more. But you see, the world will say, who needs Jesus? I mean, I'm a degree holder. I have my MBA from this whatever university. I'm a PhD lecturer. I taught all the NASA people. I taught them what they know today. And whatever it is you factor into the equation, let me tell you the truth. The, smart, the smartest person in life cannot face an iota of the challenges, the true challenges that this life will pose. With all of your degree and all of your qualifications and connections and money and influence and fame and this, when the hand of God is not in your life, you are just the enemy's launch pack. He's just waiting to unwrap it. But when you acknowledge your inadequacies, when you acknowledge that I cannot do this on my own, I don't have what it takes, when you surrender your life and the direction of your life, when you hand that over to Jesus at the point of salvation, now you are ready to face the world. Now you are ready to take your rightful place, with your rightful entitlement, with your rightful authority. And that is why Jesus is making this a general invite to all. Don't die in silence. He said in Matthew chapter 11 from verse 28 to verse 29, Matthew chapter 11, 28 to 29, he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am a gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find the rest for your soul. Every overcomer are Christ's followers because they know that it is in him and it is with him and it is through him that you can actually truthfully, correctly, without shame or guilt, without fear or trembling, you can declare that I am an overcomer. Because he said in John chapter 16, verse 33, in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you, will, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Stop running away from God. Stop hiding behind whatever excuse that you have given. Stop, stop pretending. No. Call his name. Stand your ground. Know who he is. Understand why he is and what he has done for you. Then all of your issues will become his. And you will walk away gallantly 
Casanova comma. Another portrait of overcomers is that they are filled with the presence of the Spirit of God. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Spirit of God in your life, in my life, is the difference maker. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the enabler, he's the helper, he's the com 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 comforter, he's the teacher, he's the revealer, he's the connector, he's everything. He's the one that joins man to God through Jesus Christ. And while I'm at it, let me tell you this. Contrary to the general belief that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is, is to enable you to speak in tongues and speak in other languages and, and all of that, it's a misinterpretation of what the Bible says. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just confirmed because you are able to speak in tongues. In fact, you can speak in tongues without being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, that is a big statement I've made there, and a lot of you are going to disagree. But don't, don't take my word for it. Let us hear from Jesus Christ himself. What does this say about you speaking in tongues? So before you, before you, 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 Shout from the rooftop. Let's hear what Jesus Christ said. What the Bible teaches. What the word of God tells us. In Acts chapter 16, from verse 17 to verse 18. Acts 16, 17 to 18. He said, these signs will follow those who believe. Full colon. Now he's going to tell you. He's going to list out. He's going to, 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 to highlight the signs that he's talking about. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpent. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit identifies you and he identifies with you in your inheritance through Jesus Christ. And because Jesus Christ has overcome the world and you are in him and he, his spirit is in you, now you can lift up holy hands. You can declare, you can proclaim that you are an overcomer. Because the same, the same sap that is in the tree is the same sap that is in the branches. The same spirit of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living and abiding within you. So there's nothing the enemy can throw at you that will prosper, no. There is nothing the enemy can, can bring against you that will stand the test of time because the presence of God in your life, the indwelling of the spirit of God in you and in your life has made you an indestructible person, an indestructible family, an indestructible community, an indestructible nation. Because in the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 17, it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. 
This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. God has declared you and I overcomers. He sealed us with the with His Spirit. He put the seal of approval, the seal of authority, the seal of distinction, the seal, the seal. Of, of separation from this world. He put a mark on you and I that separates us from this earth by the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. You don't believe me? Ask Peter when you see him. Peter, who could not stand before a housemaid and declare that he is one of the followers of Jesus Christ, who denied Jesus Christ openly three times in a space of between last night and this morning. That same Peter was, was he received the spirit of God. And there was a there was an there was a, a boldness that came upon him. And he stood there and he declared the gospel. And he told the people of their doings, of their wrongs, of the provision of God. And he laid it on line upon line, precept upon precept. So much so by the time he said, I will see you next week, as it were, over 3,000 people were added to the church in one day. Overcomers, they carry the presence of God through his spirit. And that's why they are not perturbed, they are not disturbed, they are not moved by what the enemy is saying or doing. No, they know there's a greater one on the inside than he that is harassing them from the outside. Overcomers. True overcomers, they live by faith and not by sight. The third portrait of overcomers is that they live their lives dictated, directed by faith in God, not by what they see, they smell, they taste, they feel, or they hear. The Christian life has a prescription of how to live. I'm not even talking of you living successfully. Just be alive. There is a prescription from God on how to live. And that prescription, that prescribed way of living, that prescribed way that qualifies you and identifies you as an overcomer, that prescribed way that says you have you 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 have God as your inheritance. That prescribed way is by faith, not by sight. In order to experience all the newness of the righteousness of God that you have become in Him and through Him, in order for you to experience the fullness of that, you have to live by faith and not by sight, because that is what overcomers do. Romans chapter one, verse 17. Romans 1, 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Who are the just? the redeemed. Who are the redeemed? The overcomers. Who are the overcomers? The followers of Jesus Christ who has been filled with the, with the spirit of God.
Let me tell you this. True faith-based living. A true faith-based living is not denying the physical evidence of what is going on in your life. Faith is not saying you don't feel the pain. Faith is not saying you can't hear the, the noise. Faith is not saying you cannot taste the bitterness of what is in your mouth. But true faith-based living is the recognition of the fact that whatever is happening to you and around you in the physical realm is not the true reflection of the will of God, of the plan of God for your life. It's not. I saw one of Steve Harvey's program recently where a lady came up and said, I need help. She said she needed help. She doesn't know who her biological father is. And if the one that she thought was found out she, he was not. And then her mom said, maybe it could be this other person and, and all. But, but that lady was in, in a, she's already got three children of her own, by the way. But there is still this search in our heart. Where did I come from? And Steve Harvey, God bless his heart. He looked at her straight in the eyes and he said, lady, before you, before you dabble into who is your father, where is your father, how's your father, as, as cogent as that is, as important as that is for you, let me tell you this, you are not an accident. The fact that you don't know who your biological father is does not make you an accident. Now, maybe they've even told you that we didn't plan for you. We didn't want you. Nobody is expecting you. You just came out of nowhere. That is their problem. You are not an accident. There is a purpose and a plan in God's heart when he created you. They were just vessels that God used to bring you onto this earth. Don't let them, don't allow anybody to label you what God has not called you. A true faith-based life is not denying the reality of the things around you. No. A true based life is a recognition of despite of all that is happening, there's a purpose in God, there's a plan in God, there's a provision in God, there's a, there, there, there is power that I can tap into in God. The truth is, whatever you see right now, Whatever you are looking at, at this very hour, they are subject to change. They are subject to change. Because the invisible realm is more real and more tangible than those things that you can relate to with, the, with your five senses of hearing, of smelling, of tasting, of feeling, or of, of whatever the fifth one is. The reason overcomers have peace is not because they don't have problems. The reason overcomers like you and I, we can sit and enjoy the goodness of God, despite the fact that the next bill is due, the pain in your mouth, the cancer that has been diagnosed, despite of all of that, overcomers have, they have come to rest. 
in the knowledge and in the understanding that that which is not seen, that which is not apparent, that which you cannot relate to with your five senses is more real than this bowl of food in front of you. Because the things that are unseen, they are more real than what you can relate to. In fact, when you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 17 to verse 18, he said, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Verse 18, while we do not look at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If you can see it, if you can feel it, if you can touch it, if you can taste it, if you can smell it, if you can hear it, it is subject to change. And that is the belief. That is where overcomers, that is where they sit. That walk, they walk and live by faith, not by sight. That sickness in your body, that disease that you're dealing with, that unruly child that you're troubling, that is troubling you, that runaway spouse that is here today, gone tomorrow, those unpaid bills that, is, that are staring you in your face, that overdrawn bank balance that the bank has called you four times about, they are as real as the shirt on your back. So there is no denying any of them. But there is something more tangible, more powerful, more real than all of them. And that is that thing, that thing that is more powerful is the presence of God, is the power of God, is the promises of God, is the covenant of God, because they are not backed by gold or silver that are fluctuating in value because somebody posted a tweet. They are not backed by, by the stock exchange that is controlled by the Reserve Bank of England and the Federal Reserve and whatever reserve and no reserve. No, the promises of God, the nature of God, the covenant of God, the power of God, they are backed by the integrity of God and of his word. And the last time I checked, it is not that God will not lie. It is the fact that it is the truth that God can not lie. It's not that he will not lie. No, he can't. He has not got the ability to tell a lie. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 17 to verse 18. He said, thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. God, he, he, he wanted you to be assured of his, of his the, the integrity of his word and of his name of his person. He swore an oath to you and I. And he committed two things that are impossible to change. 
One, God cannot lie. That's never going to change. Number two, Jesus Christ has completed the work. That is never going to change. You are not going to overcome. You have already overcome. And that is why you are called and referred to as an overcomer. So change your, change your name, change your mentality, change your expectation, change your confession tonight. Stop saying, I am going to, I am going to. No, you have already. The fullness of your victory, the fullness of my victory was established in Christ when he said, it is finished. And it is, seriously, it is finished. But for added measure of assurance, he rose from the dead. <laughs> he rose from the dead, just to tell you, I, I told you after three days, I'm going to rise. So it, now that I'm, I've, I've, I've got out of that grave after three days, everything else, at least now you know, I can keep my word. In order to solidify your victory and my victory, he gave us his Holy Spirit as the assurance, as a guarantee, as the undeniable promise of other things that are yet to come. No wonder the book of 1 John chapter 4, sorry, 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 to verse 5 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It is our faith. It is with faith. It is through faith. It is by faith that we are overcomers. You know, David was not faced by the signs of Goliath. While others were running and hiding because of his size and the, the, the loudness of his voice and whatever else the fact that David saw something big that there's no way I'm going to miss a shot at this. There's the, the area of opportunity is so big, even if I close up my eyes, I will still, I will still hit the jackpot in this. That issue that is looming so big over your life, so big over your family, so big over your business, your health, your finances, your marriage, your children, your career, your, your education, whatever it is that seemingly so big, commit to God in faith and see them dissolve just like that. Just like that. Just like that. Moses came to the front of the Red Sea and it was like, there's no going forward. And then he looked back and Pharaoh and his army were galloping down the road. They were just advancing at them. And to all of them, it was like, well, if this, if this sea don't kill us, at least the army of Pharaoh will kill them. But there is something more powerful than the Red Sea in front of you or the Pharaoh's army behind you. In fact, the Bible said, the Bible says, this, these Egyptians that you see now, that are, uh, that are closing up on you, that, are, that the horses are galloping around your heels, these Egyptians that you see right now, you will see them no more forever. Why? Because you live by faith and not by sight. You cannot claim to be an overcomer without overcoming something. So stop running from your issues. Stop running from that challenge. Stop running from that, that, that confrontation. No, stop. Turn around. Face it and defeat them just like David did Goliath. And now everybody will say, Saul has killed his thousand, but you, you have killed your 10,000. As an overcomer, another portrait is that you watch 
and you pray. You watch and you pray. You watch and you pray. You recognize that your sufficiency is from God and not in your power. Therefore, stay awake, stay alert, put your trust in him and you will see the salvation of your Lord in the land of the living. Can I tell you something? Praying to God is not a sign of weakness. As the world may want to tell you, oh, these church people, they are just lazy people. They are just this and they are that. No. That's their own trouble. Praying to God is a demonstration of your understanding, number one, of the relationship that you have with God and the knowledge that you have, one of you, the, the, the knowledge of the benefits that accrues to you as a result of that relationship. He said, I will hear you and I will respond to you when you call me, especially in your day of trouble. So why are you pro prolonging and, and, and elongating this problem? If your power, your knowledge, your ability can, can, can dissolve it, you, you won't be in that problem. You will still not be contending with that same issue. But the fact that they're still there looking at you in your eyes and refusing to go means you don't have what it takes in you. And that is the time for you to, like we sang this morning, if you don't know what to say, just say, just shout the name Jesus. Prayer is an invitation that you send to God by faith, granting God the authority to interfere in your affairs because you live on planet Earth where God has given man the authority, the, the power over what happens on Earth. God gave that to man. Man has mis obviously mismanaged it and given it to, to the enemy, but it, it re, the truth remains that the power to operate here on earth was given to man. And God is, 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 is not going to violate his promise. So in order for God to do anything here on earth, number one, he needs invitation. Number two, he needs your authority to do anything. So when you pray to God, it's not just mumbling and grumbling and all of that. No, it is you saying, Father, I give you the authority that I have as a legal establishment here on earth. I, give, I extend that to you to be involved in, the, in my affairs on earth. Many of life challenges, they are avoidable if you look at them. Many of the issues that you are dealing with it, if you are objective and you are truthful to yourself, when you look at them historically, you will see that I could have avoided this headache. But because you are not watchful, because you are not mindful, because you are not attentive, because you're not paying attention, you walk into it and then realize, uh oh. But when you set your eyes as a flint on the task that God has entrusted to you, or these instructions to you, or this purpose for your life, most of the challenges that we're dealing with in life today, most of them will not be there. Because we, we were, they won't come near us. Even if they come, they will have no, no, no claim to us because we're too consumed. We're too busy doing the things of God. But because we all live with the, in divided, not just divided nation or divided world, but even within ourselves, there, we are fighting within ourselves because of division. A divided focus, a lack of attention, a loss of concentration are some of the biggest trouble that the world is facing today. And it's just not today. It has always been like that from time immemorial.
David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he ended up in adultery, in conspiracy to murder, and even committed second degree murder. He was supposed to be at war like all the other kings, but he, he was blasé and was lazing around. And then he got bored at home when he was not doing what he was supposed to do. He got bored and started parambulating and wandering and going from place to place. And boom, he looked across the fence. And there was Bathsheba. And that was the beginning of one of the biggest calamities in David's life. He lost focus. He was not watchful. He was not paying attention. He was not going in the direction that God is leading. The big, strong, powerful Samson, in all of his power, the moment he took his eyes off the ball to go and marry from where God said, don't marry, that was the beginning of the end. Before you know it, he found himself. He found himself in the laps of Delilah. And like David, the rest is now recorded in the book of Kings. But look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah refused to be distracted, refused to be to, to be to be to lose focus of the task. He, he concentrated on rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, even though there were physical daily oppositions and harassment and threats and all of that. He, he was sword in one hand and brick laying on the other hand. And because he refused to leave, to, to shift his focus and be distracted, he finished rebuilding the wall to the glory of his God. Does that mean we're all perfect? No. Everybody have their times of lapses and an and error of judgment and this and that. But when that happens, be quick to get back on track with God. Be quick to go back to God and say, sorry, dad, I messed up there. Please forgive me. And get straight back online because your destination is, is, is total and complete peace. Finally, as we close, portrait of an overcomer. They specializes in feeding the spirit and starving the flesh. They feed the spirit and starve the flesh. Every overcomer lives a disciplined life, a life that is deliberate, a life that is dedicated, a life that is committed, a life that is disciplined. And they don't just leave it today and then tomorrow they are doing something else. No, they live that pattern of life for a considerable length of time. Unfortunately, many of us today, we lack what I call stickability. We lack the discipline, the resilience to stay on a path and refuse to give up because that is the purpose of God for your life. But the moment it doesn't work out, well, people are checking out and throwing a towel and walking away. And the overcomers don't do that. They find out what is the will of God, what's the plan of God, what's the purpose of God, what's the direction of God. And they lock themselves into it, hook, line, and sinker. It is one thing to be a winner. It's another thing to be a conqueror. But more, more so, even better than that, is to be an overcomer, to be a more than a conqueror. So this morning, or this afternoon, are you just a winner? Or are you a conqueror? Or are you just more than a conqueror? Or have you realized that you are actually an overcomer? Overcomers know their priorities. 
they know what their purpose is. So they feed their spirit and starve the flesh. Success to overcomers, success is not a destination that you arrive at, arrive at, at some point. No, for them, success is, is, is the accomplishment on a daily basis, by sides. Overcomers, they feed their spirit, they starve the flesh. And when you do that, you are a candidate, you are proclaiming to your world that this world, if you mess with him or her, you will get bruised and battered because I am an overcomer to his glory, Jesus. An overcomer, as an overcomer, God is reminding you, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let anything harass you. Why? Because he said he's your shield and your great recompense of reward. He's your shield and your protector. He's your shield and your provider. He's your shield and your encourager. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't give up on God because he will not give up on you. Why? Because he's faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. Set your eyes on the flame. Set your focus on the calling. Set your attention on the purpose and the will of God. And when you do that, you don't need to say it. Everybody that sees you, anybody that comes around you, everybody that has contact or related to you, they will declare that you are an overcomer. Amen. Maybe you are in this service this morning. Maybe you're watching at some point down the line and you're wondering, am I, am I not? Why am I not? If I am, why am I? If that is you, we can settle that easily. It is called rededication your life. Rededication of your life to Christ Jesus. But for some of us, you don't even know. You have no clue. You have no relationship with the one who can justify you and declare you an overcomer. You have nothing with him. That's fine. Come. Come this morning or this afternoon, just as you are, because he's waiting, he's longing, his arms are wide open. He wants to welcome you into the fold of the overcomers. He died for your sins. He paid for your, for your transgression. He gave you his life so that you can live while he died. He made you a promise and he kept that promise. He will continue to keep that promise for eternity. So if that is you and you are in this service today, you have no relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Today, Make it a day to be remembered forever. I will never forget the 10th of February, 1992. That was the day my heart was opened and Jesus Christ took control of me. He came into my heart and became my Lord and Savior. And I have never looked back since then. I am giving you, I'm inviting you, I am imploring you to have the same knowledge and the same experience right now. So if you don't know him, if you are not born again, if you don't know God and you have no relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ, today, right now, is your time. All that is required is a very short prayer. And that's it. So if you are ready to have a change of heart, a change of life, a change of destination, the purpose of God as an overcomer. If that is you, right now, say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, 
I come to you right now because I know that I'm a sinner. I have no relationship. I have no connection with you. I have lived all of my life in sin. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Wash me clean with your precious blood this morning. Give me a brand new start. Come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. And from this very minute, from this very moment, I promise to always follow you, to obey you, even till you come. So I thank you for saving me. I thank you for giving me a brand new start. I thank you for the newness of life that is awoken up in me. I thank you for giving me a second chance. To you alone be all the glory because now I know I'm born again. Now I know my eternity is secured. Now I know that my name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. And to you alone be all the glory. It's in Jesus' wonderful name we have prayed. Amen, amen, and amen.